My name is Tanya Finchem. I'm here today with Barbara Staggs. We're going to do the project for OSU's library uh, entitled Women of the Oklahoma Legislature, Past to Present. Barbara served in the House from 1994 to 2006, and today is April the 11th, 2007, and we're at the OSU Tulsa campus. Glad to have you here today. Thank you for asking me. Okay. Our first question is just to bring us up to date about where you are now, but start back to like place of birth, your hometown, parents, siblings, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, I was born in Hulbert. I happen to come from a generation that did have people still born at home. And I was born at my grandmother's house there. And I lived in Hulbert probably about three weeks. I don't remember those first three weeks too well. And my mother and father were in Muskogee, and we moved me to Muskogee, where their home was. And I have lived in Muskogee all of my life, except for the short period when I was a superintendent in Tahlequah. And that was just three years. And I lived, I had a house in Tahlequah because my two sons had gone to school over there and we had bought a house for them. But I lived there and I lived at home and back and forth. And then I decided, no, really my husband decided <laughs> that I was missing out on an opportunity to run for the legislature. And I had decided that I wanted to run for the legislature quite some time before that. And I probably have three of the best cheerleaders in the whole state, male cheerleaders. And he called and said, Barbara, the fellow who is the current representative is not gonna run and you would probably like to have an open seat. And so I quit my job in Tahlequah at the end of three years, telling them that I was going home to write a book, which I'm still going to do, but <laughs> I haven't been as good at that as I should have been. I just didn't want to tell them that I was going to run for office until I was really sure I was going to run for office. And Muscogee Public Schools was between superintendents and they asked me to help them out for that period of time while I was making up my mind, only they didn't know I was making up my mind either. And I did. I worked for them from the beginning of the fiscal year for the schools in July. And then I stayed until January and kept saying, Gosh, you gotta hurry up, gosh, you gotta hurry up, so I can start publicizing this, because I didn't want to do that while I was there either. Although I did drop a hint a few times. In any event, I did, uh, I did all of that preparatory work, and I jumped away from siblings, because I have no siblings. My parents are both dead now. My father died when he was very young, 44, and my mother had Alzheimer's and died several years ago. In fact, she died my first session in the legislature. And so I don't have a family. I have very few cousins, and my husband has only a brother and a sister, so we have a very, very small family. When we're gone, that'll be about the end of the Mastersons and the Stags. Well, when did in college, were you interested in politics then? Or no. no inkling to do it? No, I was interested in being a teacher. My, I, my very favorite aunt, my father's sister, and she's the only other one in my family still living, but I'm going to be up living longer than she. She's 98 right now, and I'm going to last longer than even that. I keep telling her that. Anyway, she was a wonderful teacher, and in the summertime when my mother needed a break from me, I think they didn't know what ADD was when I was growing up, and so she needed to have a little break from me, and I would always go down and stay with them because they had no children, and, and I got wonderful attention while I was with them, but I also learned a lot about teaching. She was a fantastic social studies teacher. And I decided I wanted to be a teacher. And then I had, I had good teachers in college and I had good teachers in K through 12, I mean, okay, when I was growing up. And, and all of them made good impressions on me. And I wanted to be like 
many of them, an attribute or two from one and an attribute or two from the other. And so I made up my mind to do that. And I was very active in educational groups like OEA and wasn't very active in the NEA, but in OEA I was active. And whenever we had meetings and visited with our legislators, I decided I didn't like the fact that we didn't have their attention. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and I've always been a responder to what I consider a negative threat. If you tell me I can't do something, I'm determined to prove to you that I can. And I just felt like people thought teachers would not be good legislators. And so I thought what we need to do is send more teachers to the legislature. Then maybe we can get something better done with the teacher retirement system, which I was not able to do at all the entire time we were there. We made only one change that was a very positive change while I was there. And I, I really felt like that was what we needed. So when my husband said, you need to come home if you're gonna run for the legislature, then I came home and I got a big surprise. He decided he was going to run again. And by that time I'd already told a lot of people about it and, and they made me feel good. Whether they were genuine or not, and I really think that they were, they encouraged me and said you'd do a good job. So by the time we got down to the filing period, it was Barbara and four males. So I just did Barbara. And I don't know whether they just felt sorry for me or they really liked it. But nevertheless, I, I loved running. And I had been told by a young man who had been in the high school when I was an administrator in the high school in Muskogee. Um, he had run and he shared some, of, he ran again when I did, but he shared some of his wisdom with me and said, Barbara, you will love this. You're a people person and you will love going door to door. And I thought, door to door sounds like a breeze. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that would be one of the most difficult things I did campaigning, but nevertheless, it was the most fun thing. And I'm a very visual person. I'm not an auditory person. And consequently, I can tell you where just about everybody in my district lived, but I might not be able to remember the conversation that I had with them. Most of the time I could remember a little bit, but, but the best thing was I could remember when I came there to their house and, and how much fun I had visiting with them and I, and I knew where the house was again. Did you have to do as much each time you campaigned, each time, um, each time you ran? I think it's pretty obvious I like to talk. So I don't think I ever cut down very much. I might cut out the Republicans and focus on the Democrats since I'm a Democrat. But I also had a lot of Republicans who were supporters too. And I believe that Muskogee, while we have some yellow dog Democrats and yellow dog Republicans, we have a lot of moderate Republicans too. And my philosophy is pretty moderate. I'm fiscally very conservative. My mother was German and I know how to pinch pennies. And when it's somebody else's pennies, I pinch even harder. So I, I was in line with them in lots of ways. And I had also been a Republican at one time in my life. And my husband's comment when I decided that I was going to change back was, oh, I'm glad you finally seen the light because <laughs> he was always a Democrat. But I changed parties when I was in Tahlequah before I ever decided to run for office. I changed because the senator there, Herb Roselle, said, Barbara, you are absolutely worthless to me as a Republican. I need you and I need you to be a Democrat. And I had gotten been out of joint with the Republicans over several education issues. Mostly that was my only area of major disagreement with them. 
but I definitely disagreed with them on lots of education issues. So it was not difficult for me to change, and I changed there, and then I've been a Democrat ever since. Well, did you have the same campaign manager through the 12 years? Yes, I did. Um, I kind of like to do a lot of things myself. It's not that I can't delegate, but the woman who was my campaign manager was a friend who lived down the street and owned a flower business. And I just asked her, I needed someone on a piece of paper to be my campaign manager. And she said, that, oh yeah, she'd be happy to do that. So. Yes, she was there the whole time. I probably did not use her as much as maybe many use theirs, but I I was not an individual that had someone else running my campaign and telling me what to do. And I realize in larger communities, that's probably a necessity. I don't know, but I, I suppose that it probably is, but as I said a few moments ago, I'm very conservative with a dollar, and I wasn't interested in spending my money on, on someone to do what you ordinarily think that a campaign manager does. That first year in 94, I probably spent, I don't even know, but I probably spent in the neighborhood of 20 or $25,000 and 12 years later, you can begin to run a campaign on that. And, and probably most of the expense that I had was just material that I handed out to people and postage for things that I mailed to them and some advertising, and that was about it. So your last campaign cost how much? Then we can figure out the difference. I, not a great deal different, no. I probably spent maybe Thirty-five or forty thousand dollars, because few of those things had gone up. But I did not spend a lot of money on campaigns; just, just couldn't do it. Well, your first election, you won by like seventy-five percent of the vote, or something like that, was it? No, it was very close. Was close. Okay. Yes, because the incumbent, the one who had said he wasn't going to run again, the incumbent and I were running together. We had to have a runoff after the primary. And there was no uh, general election opponent. No Republican ran that year. Now, they ran every year after that, but they didn't run that year. And um, I would say that it was more like either I was in the upper 50s and he would have been in the upper 40s or maybe we were both a little bit lower than that. I was a little lower and he was maybe a little bit higher than that. But I really don't remember. I'm one of those that throws things away. <laughs> well, how long had he been in office then? 20 some odd years. And had a woman ever held the office from the, your district? No. No. So it was a major coup for a woman to be a man that had been in that spot for quite some time. But he had a reputation for not always being nice to his opponents, to being kind of tough on them. He was never that way with me. And his wife was one of my best friends during the campaign. We always sat together. And I, I don't have any complaints about that first campaign and his decision. He probably, you know, he was an age where, and there still are a lot of men who feel like this. I had a lot of men say to me, older men, of course, Barbara, I just can't vote for you. I just don't think a woman ought to do those things. You know I like you and I like Ross. I just can't vote for you. And he may have decided to run again because he didn't want to see a woman get it. I don't know. But I know that he was never um, he was never ugly to me in any way during the campaign. I don't really believe I've ever had an opponent who has been. And yes, and I'll say that I think that there's one thing that at the local level anyway, 
has not really changed much in all of that time. It's not just me. I think for a male to be really tacky to a female incites some hostility from other females, mm -hmm. and they're going to respond positively to the female if she's not being tacky herself, if she's just passing it off and going on, and this is business, and, you know, I go out and eat with them later. So I think that uh, we still have a little bit of that on the federal level and, and maybe in some areas of the country, but I don't think that we have it in Oklahoma. I think that a few decided that if you didn't want the woman to win the race, you better not make it easy for her by cutting her down and making her look bad. Well, how many other women were in the house when you were your first your first time in? I can't tell you that, but I can tell you that I looked up where Oklahoma ranked in all of the states in the country with the number of women legislators, and we were dead last. And the other states were not large, but we were absolutely dead last, and I don't know that that has ever changed for Oklahoma. It would be like teacher's pay. If it moves up one, it might be a little bit higher for a year or two, and then it's back down. Um, I think maybe in the House, at one time we had five or six out of 101, and that's minuscule. The Senate has had, proportionately, they have had a few more because they only have 48 people over there. And I would say right now, I can't, I can't be accurate, but I would say right now they probably have about six. Well, what do you think we need to do to get those numbers up? Well, I think we need to do lots of things. First of all, we need to convince people that women bring to the table an important ingredient in legislation. Not only it does our presence cut down some dirty jokes and a few things like that that go on when there are no women there, because I've been on boards and I've been in groups of superintendents and I know when there are women there, the conversation subject matter is a little different than it is when we are there. But in addition to what I would consider the moral area of why we need to be there, I think we also bring to the table attributes that are not so common in men. It's not that men do not like children. I know that they like children. But there are not very many men who have spent years of their lives home with their children doing educating at home when before they get to kindergarten. And there are not very many men who do the caregiving uh, roles that women do, not only with their own parents, but probably with their husband's parents as well. We just have an interest in areas that I don't want to say the men are not interested in, but I would say they don't have the experience in it that we have. And, and I think that's wonderful. My issues were education, which involves not only teachers and administrators, but it definitely involves kids. And that's something we're very interested in. And we're also interested in older people. Not only do we realize, and sometimes it hits you kind of hard as you start getting there. I did not like turning 65, but I also don't like the alternative. So I think we have a, a sincere, genuine interest and experience in older adults. And... We are, it's not that men are not good listeners. I think men are good listeners, but I think not only are we good listeners, but I think we understand some things to ask older people that maybe do not come to men. I think that an all-male group is minus an, 
significant factor if they do not have women on every committee that they have in the House and in the Senate or whatever the, the group may be, even if it isn't legislators. If you don't have at least one female on it, there's something missing. We bring attributes that are different. It's not that they're better, it's simply that they're different. And when females are the majority of the population, I think it's a little strange for us not to be present every place there's a decision-making process. Well, what do you think is the biggest hurdle from the woman's point? You know, um, there. I'm not sure I know. I think I understand a little better after having been there. So I'll give you two or three instances. Okay. If you live in the Oklahoma City area, it's much easier for you to be on the Oklahoma legislature because you don't have to leave your families in order to go stay in a hotel while you're in Oklahoma City. So that's a factor if we want women from a lot of different areas. I live in what is, is classified as a rural area because Muskogee is not the size of, of Oklahoma City and Tulsa. I would never have considered it a rural area until I got there and found out about that. I knew we had lots of farmers and, and I love horses, but I didn't know anything about agriculture, nothing at all. Now I had some good friends in my district, some good constituents who helped educate me in that area, but in the western part of the state, we have many more women who are active in agriculture out there. I want them to be sent to the legislature. I don't think, now I, I could be mistaken with the current group that's in there because I do not know all of the brand new ones, but I think that they bring, even in the area of agriculture, some different attributes than the men have. And I think that we need to be present on everything. One of the funnest bills, and funnest is one of my favorite words, one of the funnest bills I ever did was a crossbow hunting bill. And everyone looked at me like I was nuts. But I had a man in my district who had a very serious disability. And the hunting laws in Oklahoma, I have to admit, I hunted when I was a kid. I've told you I was an only child, and I think you've probably figured out well, she was probably a tomboy, and I was. And I hunted with my father and target shooting and things like that. So I had no objections to hunting or fishing or any of those things. And this guy came to me and said, you know, I like to hunt with a bow, but I cannot hunt because I cannot stand up like you need to stand up to hunt. And he said, I wish you would do something about the law that would allow those of us who have some disabilities, because it wasn't legal to hunt with a crossbow. He said, I wish you would figure out a way to, to help us so that we could do that if we have disabilities that keep us from being able to hunt with a regular bow. I thought that's interesting. And of course, I've always been an educator, not only for everybody else, but for me too. So I learned a lot about crossbow hunting and, and all of those things and about the wildlife section. Well, I found out that I had a bunch of good friends in the wildlife section of, of Oklahoma, and I really still enjoy seeing them and finding out about the things they do when they when they put trout in the streams so that we have better fishing opportunities here in Oklahoma for trout and, and all kinds of things like that. But they sent me a little plaque and it, it was legislator of the year for the, for the crossbow bill and, and I appreciated it. But I think that my concern for his disability and his inability to be able to do something he loved to do with his son was what got me interested in it. 
And I just think that women bring those attributes. We, we show up on, on pieces of legislation that people wouldn't think we would be the least bit interested in as females. But we've got to bring females from all across the state, not just those that live in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And that was probably one of the most difficult things for me was to go over there for four months. I think my husband loved it. He didn't have anybody making out any honeydew lists for him while I was, and, and he had his own business to take care of. I think he probably came to the legislature. Well, I know he came six times when I was sworn in, but I don't imagine he came but two or three times more than that. So did you rent an apartment or yes. a hotel room or what? Uh, all of those. <laughs> I lived in a bed and breakfast and Mary easily moved into that same bed and breakfast while I was there. Then we moved and we went to a hotel and, and Jerry Askins and Mary and I lived in different rooms, but right next to each other while we were in the hotel, and then we were a motel, and then we went to another one, and then we rented an apartment, and the three of us lived together. Then Mary went someplace else. I don't remember where Mary went, but she's still in the Senate. And then Jerry and I rented an apartment together. So I've lived with Jerry for 12 years, and I probably lived with Mary or right next to Mary for, well, I don't know, maybe six or eight years of that time because we were always very good friends and, and enjoyed talking about bills together too. There wasn't a living allowance, so that just came out of your regular salary then? No, no, there was a living allowance. Okay. You had a per diem and it took care of meals and it took care of, uh, of where you were staying, and it took care of transportation back and forth from wherever you lived to Oklahoma City. And the people in Oklahoma City or the surrounding area, and there's a mileage limit on that, I'm not sure what it is, but it was just easier for them to go home to their families. And my children, for the most part, were both grown. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, my older son, who is a teacher, uh, had already gone west. And my younger one, who is a, a diabetic, was, well, no, he lived with Rick for a while, so he may have been out there too when I first started. But all three of them were wonderful cheerleaders and encouraged me and sometimes it's tougher on a spouse than it is the person who's there. And I think the reason it's tougher on a spouse is men are a little better at blowing things off than women are, except I blow off pretty good. It, it's a job. You, know, you can't be mad at somebody for the way they voted on your bill because next week you may need them to vote on something else. And I, I was able to do that pretty good. But my husband was always the kind that, Barbara, don't worry about it. You're not gonna have any competition in this race. And he just kind of kept, kept me built up a lot. And that's, that's marvelous. Well, can you tell me more about your first day you were sworn in and feelings and Emotions. And um, can't remember who the Supreme Court Justice was who swore us in the first year. I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going all the way around the bush as you found I do. Okay. Um, the Supreme Court Justices come from all over the state, and there was one there from Muskogee who happened to be a good friend of mine. And if he didn't swear us in the first year, he did the second time we were elected because I have a picture showing him the back of his head as he's swearing us in. And one of the things I always like to tell kids, especially kids from Muskogee, because it costs quite a bit to get a school bus and pay 
for bringing them to Oklahoma City. And kids who live in Midwest City and, and Dell City and Oklahoma City and even to Edmond and those places can come to visit the Capitol so much more often than our kids. And I always said, I want you to know how many people there are who work at the Capitol and they're from Muskogee. And I can point to Drew Edmondson, I can point to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, I can point to a guy who worked in the treasurer's office, I can, uh, I can point to a lot of people who were up there to encourage them and say, there's a place for you to work in that area if you really want to. And then, of course, there were three of us, Ben Robinson and Bill Settle and me when I first went up there. And those were two guys that were not like other guys. I had no problems getting along with them, and they were always very, very good to me. And now I said I'd get back to your question, and I've forgotten what it was. Maybe I have to. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> oh, your first day. What was your oh, the first swearing in. in. Uh, you go into the legislature, and you work your way up on the floor. You move, as you are reelected. you move up closer to the front. And they sit in two groups, Republicans on one side, and well, on the left side, the Democrats and the Republicans on the right side. And Jerry and I were there on the very back row. And so it was not difficult for us to point ourselves out in the picture. We were the smallest ones in it, but we could, you know, could definitely point us out since we were on the back row. And the gallery is just packed because everybody's there to see their son, their daughter, their friend, their spouse get sworn in. I don't really remember anything special about it, except it was the first time that I had to sign the pledge that said that I'll do everything I'm supposed to do. I will abide by the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Oklahoma, and I will not take any money for anything other than the salary that I receive for my job. And I thought that was a good statement to have on there. And that was the first time I had ever seen that. And, and they still have exactly the same one. What well, do you remember your first day debating a bill where you were the woman leading the charge? I can remember several that I was still on the back row. <laughs> so it would have been in the first year or two. Um, one of my very, let's see, this passed in 96. So yes, it was my first session still, first term. I was bringing a bill to put the Music Hall of Fame in Muskogee. And I'm not a very original person outside of education. I know a lot of things that, that I'd like to see changed in education. And for the most part, I was very quick to discover when you've been out of the school building, though, four or five years, they've made some changes you may not know about. But the fellow who was uh, working on this idea was in Muskogee, and he asked me if I thought I could get a bill passed for that. And I thought, sure, that wouldn't be any problem. We're just going to put the Music Hall of Fame in Muskogee. Well, Shawnee jumped up, and they were very concerned. They had lots of things that they thought ought to be in a Music Hall of Fame, and why shouldn't it be in Shawnee? And Tulsa, that has the, the Jazz Hall of Fame here, thought that we were going to try to take over everything that they did. So I started out in committee with having to do some more work to explain to them that this statewide Music Hall of Fame would be an umbrella Hall of Fame. It would cover all kinds. They wanted to limit us to uh, country and Western music, and that was not our intent. We have an awful lot of people who have been inducted into the Hall of Fame that that happens to be their genre, but we were interested in anybody that had been 
a longtime resident of Oklahoma or had been born and lived here for a significant period of time. And I had to do some work to convince the people from Sean, and I thought I wasn't going to be able to. I really did. I had some doubts, and I don't usually have too many doubts if I've done my homework. Um, I can get surprised, but I, I had a pretty tough time on that. And we finally got it passed when I convinced everybody that it was not our intention of closing down anybody's or inhibiting anyone else from starting a Hall of Fame that would maybe be something to represent the individual who had been born in that town. Because that would also tell us that some, this is someone we need to induct into the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame. And now it's the Music Hall of Fame and Museum. And we're working to improve that. And, and I think everybody likes to give birth to something new. I just don't know that I was of the birthing age when I did that one initially, but but it was fun when it was all over and I'd gotten it passed. And in fact, this last year, they put me in the Music Hall of Fame and made me the governor's pick or something like that. And I said, you all know I cannot carry a tune. I cannot play an instrument. I can't do any of those things. And they said, well, we have this category for people don't, who don't have any skills. <laughs> and I said, well, I fit that then. <laughs> well, are there any other bills that you're proud of? Well, I was chair of education, or one area of education at a time, uh, for several years. And I always considered it my responsibility not only to encourage and, and maybe help improve a good bill, but I felt like it was very important for me not to hear bills that were not good. You don't want to take a risk that they get away from you and someone else thinks, well, that sounds good, and they vote for it. And I did a lot of not hearing bills. So I felt like it was just as important for me to see that the legislation that we sent out was good legislation insofar as we could could improve it to make it that way, but to also keep bad legislation from coming out. And, and bad legislation depends on what party you belong to. Mm -hmm. And now that the, the Republicans are in control of the House, we have had legislation that I not only the last two years that I was in there and the Republicans were in charge, but not only at that time, but we've got some right now that are bad that I'm really hating to see come through. And they have the opportunity because of their, their number to be able to pass those. And the Senate has a difficult time because of their number being able to stop it. And... I'm, I'm concerned that we will continue to do good education legislation, but I probably, I was a vice chair of some other committees, but I was never a chair of any committee that was not the education or one segment of education or another. How often were you the only woman on the, on the committee? Uh, don't believe I was ever the only woman on education, and that's a very interesting observation. Many times men thought they should put women on these committees that they call soft committees, and it's interesting that you have more education legislation than almost any other legislation. Why do we consider it soft legislation? And the very first are soft issues. The very first term that I was there, there was a committee called Family Issues or something like that. And it was a wicked committee. It really got tough, tough, 
issues. The woman who was in charge of that was a tough, tough person. And she handled it very, very well. And I was very proud of her. But they think that family issues are going to be things that people will readily agree on. You know, we're having, we're having lots of controversy in our whole country over things that most of us would consider family issues, over changing the way we do divorces, or, or gay issues, or all of those things. They are not soft issues. And so I always had women on education because they thought that, that that was a soft place to put them. In addition, though, that was not the only committee that I would be on or they would be on. And I think many of them, of the women, chose education because they liked to. We got to choose four committees we would like to be on. And then they made sure that we could be on there by virtue of there weren't too many people on that committee. And I think that sometimes it was choice that they made, but I also think sometimes it was the fact that men thought that would be an easier committee or they thought it was a committee they would know more about than energy or insurance or, or things like that. We're interested in energy and we're also interested in insurance, and there are a lot of women who are by themselves because they choose to be that way. They choose not to get married. There are a lot of women who are single because they're divorced, or they are also single because their spouse has died. They need to know about energy, and they need to know about all of these issues. They don't need to be left out of them because it's kind of like going to buy a car and the salesman never talks to you if you've got your husband with you. I have a good friend who said she and her husband decided they would go together to look at a car because she valued his opinion. But they also decided if the person who came out to wait on them did not look at her and understand that she was the decision maker in that, they were going to leave. Good for her. Yes, and good for him. I think that's terrific. Well, describe a typical day. How early would you start your day and how late would you work in the evening, typically? Um, it never worked. My philosophy was I'm going to try to get all my work done in Oklahoma City and not have to take it home with me because I like to do things with my husband and also because I was well known to show up at everything. And, and I tried to. I, I wanted to know what people in my district were doing. And, and my husband loved pie auctions. So we always went to all the 4-H and the FFA and anybody who had a pie auction, we could probably show up there. But um, I always went early. Usually I was there by 7 or 7.30. And oh, I've stayed till 10 or 11. And I did not stay. I, I did that more when I was there at the very first because you don't have a history of the laws unless you happen to be an attorney. And since I wasn't an attorney, I needed to go back and look on at things and maybe even talk to someone else. Bill Settle, who was there during the first part of my time in the legislature, was also a late person. He was not an early person, but he was a late person. So I had someone who would walk me to my car if I felt like I needed to. And, and they have changed over time. If they're still doing the same thing, they had a man who sat in the parking lot until all of our cars were gone. And, and I appreciated that. I've always said if anybody looked at me close, they'd run, they wouldn't try to accost me. But but I don't want the experience, so. Well, which floor was your office on? Did you get to move in around, I guess? Oh, yes. Um, my office started in what they call the fishbowl, and we shared secretaries over there. And it was on the third floor, I think. 
Um, yes, I'm almost certain it was. Then we went to the third floor, but we went around on another wing of it. And I really liked the third floor. They decided to move some of the staff out to another place and expand the area where the legislators were. And when they did, they didn't have any marble to replace some of the marble that was in the hallway. So they did carpet and marble and carpet and marble. You can imagine how the noise of heels and shoes went down and we loved it there. And Jerry and Mary and I were usually pretty close to each other where our offices were as well. Um, don't think, I know, I was never on the fourth floor. I was only on the fifth floor after the Republicans came to office. And, and the fifth floor was where most of the Republicans were when we were in power and when the Democrats had them the majority in the legislature. The offices were smaller, um, had to climb five flights of stairs. Of course, for the tomboy, that was just good exercise for me, and I didn't really mind that part. But the offices were pretty small, and the very first year I laughed because I could sit on the sofa in my office and put my feet, the sofa where my guests sat, and put my feet on my desk. And I got back to almost that position the last two years that I was there too. Did you have a role model? A mentor? Um, no, I guess, um, I guess I really didn't. And I guess I really haven't at, at different times. I have looked to people for different things. If there's something that I consider them to be pretty good at, well then I, I try to talk with them and, and learn what I need to know about whatever that issue is. I, I don't suppose I've ever had one person in my life. I. The closest that I would come to would be my husband because he is so extremely laid back and and I still think I may have a little ADD. He's he's just, you know, real cool. I He rarely ever gets excited or upset about something and and that's that's a good person to have around. That attribute alone is one that I probably need more. I need his help too when it comes to saying no to things because I'm not particularly good at saying no. If I can figure out a way to squeeze it in and then help somebody, then I'll try to do it. And he's like that too, but he manages to get out of them after a period of time. And I stay around for a long period usually. How long have you been married? For, you know, see, I told you before we started, I'm not good with numbers. I do not even remember our anniversary date. No. Um, we will have been married, I can do it like this, in 59 was when we were married. So in 09, we will have been married 50 years. So we have been married 48 years this August. That works. Yes. <laughs> I can do the math. I just don't, I don't clutter my brain with numbers. Well, do you have a particular uh, political philosophy? Um, as I said, I'm a Democrat. And I suppose my political philosophy has to do with my personal philosophy and the things that I've always believed in, and my husband has too. He never came to an event to hear me speak. He said, I can hear you at home. But if they had kids doing something, he always went with me. And, and we're both like that. We like to do things with kids and he is very good about helping people. 
Now, he's not so good about helping me with the yard work, although he has been pretty good this year because of the ice storm, and we've had such an unusual amount of it. But, but I happen to like doing it anyway, and he doesn't happen to like doing it, so that's part of the difference. Um, but we like... We like to help people. If we see people that have difficulties or they ask us to help them with something, we try to. That's probably been one of my worst situations since I left office. I have always tried to help people. I'll always call you back. I just, there are only a couple of people in my district who can say that I didn't return a telephone call and it's because I punched the erase button instead of the forward button to the next message. And I, I always return telephone calls. And I have a lot of people now who call me and still ask me questions. I've got to do some research today on a bill that's in the legislature and get a message to a guy who wants me to let him know how it's going. And I will. And, and I still have friends who work at the legislature, so staff people have always been gracious to me, whether it's when I was there or now. And, and I appreciate that because they know they're really answering this for a citizen in the state, and, and that's good. The only thing is I probably need to learn to say, you have a new legislator, and you really need, to, I know what I should say, you really need to call them. They would want to do this for you, I certainly would hope so, because they want you to vote for them the next time. Mm -hmm. But they end up being people that I know, and I've done lots of, you know, over 12 years, you talk to a lot of folks. And I've got one to call on the way home that I'm sure it's, a, it's an education issue that, because she's a teacher that she wants to ask me about. And the legislator we have now is not a teacher. And so that might be the reason. Or maybe she just doesn't know him. I don't know. I will tell you another philosophy, though, that I'm glad you let me talk long enough to remember this. I think that many, many women who are my age have this same philosophy, although they may not verbalize it, and maybe they don't even realize it. But many of us have been the first ones to do things in, in different areas. I was the first female superintendent in Tahlequah. And although interim, the first interim female superintendent in Muscogee, and the first one to do several things. As an administrator, I was the first secondary female principal. And my philosophy has always been, I want to do a good enough job that they will not say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll never vote for another woman again because of the way she was. People never say, I'm not gonna vote for another man. But they would say, I'm not gonna vote for another woman if I had done a lousy job in some of those places, or I'm not ever gonna put a woman in that position. So I feel that's part of my philosophy that has driven me to try to do the best job I can do so that another woman can come after and she won't have to bear the brunt of having followed me. And, and I want to see that change. I want women not to have to feel that way. And that's going to take quite a while. You know, I see women who climb poles to do outside work for the telephone company. I don't remember seeing that until maybe just the last few years. That's true. I just, I want women to be able to do whatever it is they want to do and not have someone say, ah, 
We had a woman do that once before and we won't ever make that mistake again. Well, is there anything you wish you had accomplished while you were in those 12 years that you could just couldn't, oh, get, couldn't get done? There were lots of things, yes. Um, I wanted to get money into the teacher retirement. And it didn't make any difference if it was Democrats or Republicans. We made only one change that was a significant change, and it was moving the fund from which uh, teacher retirement got its money from where it was in oil and gas over to uh, taxes. And, and with the Republicans in there now and their desire to always reduce taxes, ours was a percentage of the tax money and that amount of money has gone down. So I, that's the one thing I regret the very, very most. I'm, I'm pleased with some things that I was able to do in education, but I really feel like that one, I just, 12 years and I never got it. Not anything that was significant. I thought though, the tax thing was gonna be pretty good, but it really didn't. And I think we're also getting very close to the end of this tape. Is it flashing at us? It's flashing at me. Okay. Well, just a minute. Is there anything I need to ask that I haven't thought of? I don't know. I'm going to look down this first list you gave me. Um, it doesn't do any good to ask me these things about my prior experience in political things because I didn't have any. And who endorsed me with a an incumbent staying in there, usually endorsements don't leave the incumbent. That's the reason they always say it's easier to win as an incumbent. So I didn't have a lot of groups that endorsed me. And and I understood that. Did so I'm gonna roll this in it, doesn't matter. Go ahead. Come roll with my paper up here too. No, you're good. It's not in the shop. Pardon? It's not in the shop. The paper's good. Oh, oh, okay. Um did I have any people uh support me? Well yeah. I had a lot of people support me, but as far as groups collectively even OEA, now the teachers in my town did support me, but OEA didn't because they went with the incumbent. And even I didn't understand about the Speaker of the House. He came over and had his picture taken with the incumbent and it infuriated me. <laughs> and I thought he ought to just be quiet. And I said something to Bill and he said, oh, the speaker will always support the incumbent. That's just one of those political policies that they do. And I said, I'll just remember that. And after the election was over and I had won and the speaker called me, he said, I wanted you to know that I'm happy for you and we're going to be able to work together. I said, yes, I'll give you an opportunity to apologize in some way. <laughs> Anyway, he's a good friend of mine, and he's somebody that everyone would recognize. But it was it was fun. There were so many things that I didn't know that I had to learn, and and they weren't things that bother me. Those things don't bother me. It's just I didn't know that what that was the way it was done. I taught parliamentary procedure in school. I just knew that I was going to be able to teach everybody over there how to do parliamentary procedure, and they don't use the same form. It was just hilarious. There were so many things that were different from what I anticipated. I thought they were all going to be so glad to have me because I came with all of this information that they needed to have.
A lot of people say that teachers are not good um, at working in campaigns. I'd never heard anybody say it until after I got in office. And I would, I can't say that that's true because they were the people who did a million things for me. When I had telephone numbers that needed to be looked up, when I had, you know, I've already told you I'm tight. I didn't pay for someone to do a poll for me. I told them how to do it. And then I got some teachers to do a, a poll for me. And I know they did a good job because it was pretty on when I looked at what the results were. Um, I think that education and my experience in education were significant factors. Not only did I say that I was concerned about and interested in education, but I had a background of having been there. And when I say I was never in any political thing before, the Education can be pretty political, too, especially when you're a superintendent or a principal. So I did have that little experience. But basically, I just had some wonderful teachers who came to help me. And I think maybe people just need to ask them more. And maybe that's what we need to do with a lot of people, is ask them to do things for us. Because... I'm, I'm impressed with the young people who are getting interested in politics, but it isn't a large group. And I'm concerned that the future may have fewer people who go to vote than what we even have now. And I really believe we need to work at keeping people focused on, if you don't take... If you don't go vote, that's the minimum thing that you should do. Then you should be ashamed of yourself. The next thing is you ought to be active. I was just recently elected the county Democrat chair in Muscogee County. And I really wasn't ready to do it, but I thought maybe I can get some more people involved and we can and we can work to change some things. We have two young people in this group, and we had about 80 that day. Only two young people. And I'm really concerned about that. The young people who are interested seem to be vibrantly interested. But I'm not sure the Democrats are working as hard as we ought to work to get young people moved back in. I was at the high school the other day, though, and a young man came up to me and said, I want to come do some things for you. I see that you're going to be working with the Democrat Party in Muskogee. So, you know, little by little, I think we can get them in. But I am concerned about that. You, you had on here a question about tough choices. That's a, a pretty funny one. Because I had spent so much time in school, when we had the concealed weapons bill, I had a pretty difficult time with it. Guns, to me, were, we kept them locked up. You know, I didn't, I wasn't that concerned about them. And my dad had taught me how to take care of them. And Ross had, had taught our sons how to take care of them. But the notion of concealed weapons really kind of bothered me because I thought we're going to have kids bringing these things to school. Well, it's true we do, but I had, I had one call from my husband in 12 years, and he called and said, I'm one of your constituents. I want to tell you that I would appreciate it very much if you would vote for the concealed weapons bill. And I said, well, I'll be sure to write this down that you have called and we'll remember that. And I appreciate it and, you know, just went like that. Then I had a jillion women. And I don't know how big a jillion is, but it's a whole bunch. 
and they were women who worked in the evening, worked at night, went out to their cars after it was dark. They they worked in the hospital or they worked different places doing late jobs and said, make an honest woman out of me. I carry a gun and I will make it a concealed weapon and I'll take all the training I'm supposed to have. And it was the women who made the difference for me. I still have those reservations because of the school. But women were saying that they were in places after dark that they did not feel safe. And they obviously had spent a little time learning to use a gun because I had some who told me that either they had spouses who had helped them or they had children in some cases, grown children who had helped them. And that, that bill bothered me. I, I have some others that I disagree with my constituents on, maybe, and I will vote the way the constituents want me to vote unless I can really see that they don't understand an issue. And then I've always told my constituents, if you and I disagree, it's your responsibility to educate me or it's my responsibility to educate you. And one thing I always did was a survey. I did a survey every year, not just election years, because I would tell them what I anticipated seeing in legislature the next year and ask them how they felt about it. And they had a pretty good response to that. And not only does it give you an excuse like on the concealed weapons bill when all of them called me and I went over to that side. It also reinforces you when all of you seem to agree. And one of the things that really pleased me in the 12 years I was in the legislature was my constituents and I agreed the majority of the time on most of the things that I asked them about. I was I was very surprised um, on right to work. When I first started asking right to work, it was, oh, a very minuscule number of people who were in favor of right to work. And I must have asked that then for four or five years and it increased in the number that were in favor of a right to work. It never got significantly above 50%, but I would say initially it was down in the 20s. And it, it was an, uh, an interesting observation because it means that those folks opposed to right to work, I mean, in favor of a right to work, were doing some kind of a good campaign that was convincing people that that needed to be here. And I was, I've never been a person in favor of right to work. So that was a real surprise to me. And, and I'm sure that we have passed lots of things that have had really good campaigns with the public as well as with the legislators to get them passed. And I may have been guilty of of falling prey to some of those campaigns too. But over the course of the year, you have to go through an awful lot of fields too, don't you? Can read or read an awful lot. Yes, um, and that was a surprise to me. I was sure that nobody up there was reading those bills, and I was going to be the only one reading them. You know, I just had all kinds of grandiose ideas about <laughs> what it was going to be like when I arrived. And I discovered that by far the majority of them read them. And when you went to committee, if the bill was in that committee, it was rare indeed for a person sitting there not to have read the legislation because they would have little tabs on them. And, and I was a magic marker and highlighter. and. We didn't always agree on the bill, of course, but I knew that they had studied it and I was interested in, in their opinion on that. 
Another thing that surprised me about the legislature is that all of us have a background and the experiences that we've had are the things that help us do a good job and maybe a bad job, but mostly a good job in certain areas. And I would say that almost everybody in the House and Senate has a friend in that body who is good at something. They may be, they may be insurance people. They either own an insurance office or they've been in insurance sales for years. And when we have insurance bills, then you go visit with that person. And it doesn't make any difference what party they're in. When it comes to that, you want the best information you can get. And, and I'm not going to ask the author of the bill so often as I'm going to ask a person who's had experience in that area because they will generally tell you both sides of it. And, and I also have a reputation at when a lobbyist would visit me. I'll be happy to hear your side of it, but I also want you to tell me what the other side is as well. And the lobbyists that we had in Oklahoma City, with the exception of maybe a couple of them, didn't lie to you. They, they would tell you the good and the bad, and they're going to embellish the good as much as they possibly can, but they would tell you both sides of it. And they'd say, this is what the other side is saying and wanting. And those things are important to you. And I think you decide you're going to not deal with somebody who doesn't tell you the truth. Because I had a couple of people that I wasn't interested in visiting with them when they come to tell me about something. And they, they quickly learn you're not going to pay any attention to them, so they don't come by. And that makes it a whole lot easier. I think that's just about it every place, unless you've got something. Well, my last question is when history is written about you, what would you like for it to say? Well, um, I've probably told these things off and on. I would like, I would like them to say that I listened to my constituents and I tried as often as I could to support those things that they wanted me to support and to not support those things that they wanted me to vote against. And I hope that I was always truthful with them. I'd say you were. <laughs> well, that's all of my questions. Thank you very much for